Good evening. Good evening. Uh, wonderful to see all of you here tonight. Uh, my name is Pastor John Arndt. I serve at your sister uh, Wells Congregation Reformation over in Genesee Depot. It's a, a, an honor and a privilege to be able to be with you tonight to worship together with you as we gather together around the amazing love of our Savior. Uh, for our, our Lenten meditations this year, uh, we're focusing on the theme, the ironies of the passion. There are those times where we think that we know what uh, is going to come next, one plus one, and we know what the answer is going to be to that. But then there are these ironies that we find in the Passion where this happens and it's combined with this and we think that we know what the outcome is going to be but God turns everything on its head and he inserts these ironies into the story of Jesus. Uh, so blessings to all of us as we gather together and see the ironies that God presents to us alongside of his love. Uh, the order of service that we're going to follow is printed in your folder. We begin by lifting our voices together with the words of the opening hymn number 114, Christ the life of all the living. May God richly bless your worship tonight in the name of Jesus, your Lord and your Savior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
hasten to save me, O Lord. O Lord, come quickly to help me. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of the heart. Bless the Lord who forgives our sins. His mercy endures forever. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, kindle within us the fire of your love, that by its cleansing flame we may be purged of all of our sins and made worthy to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue with our psalm. We'll speak the verses responsively and join in the refrain. fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. We commit ourselves to you, O Lord. Your faithfulness endures forever. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. We come. I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. We join. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We commit ourselves to you, Lord. O God, compassionate Father and friend, remember not our sins, but rather remember your love and mercy. Relieve our distress and satisfy us with eternal peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our passion history for this evening, compiled from the four gospel writers. Uh, we begin with the first portion, the upper room. In the evening, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. 
having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well, then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that is why he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Once you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. They all drank from it. Then Jesus said, The hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays him. It would be better for him if he had not been born. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After Jesus had said this, he was deeply troubled. His disciples were very sad. They stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant and began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. One after the other, they began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, It is one of the twelve. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The disciple whom Jesus loved was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. 
As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said, that, said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? A dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them are given the title benefactor. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. We continue with the next hymn, number 126. Lord Jesus, you are going forth.
Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness, I am your sin. You, be you became what you were not and made me what I was not, your fellow redeemed by the Christ of God. The portion of God's word which is in front of us for the growth of our faith and our Savior and for the power for our Christian living from Luke uh, chapter 23, beginning at verse 6. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man, that is Jesus, was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had, wanted to see, he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. This is God's word. We bow our heads in prayer. May the words of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts, may these be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, um, the ironies of the passion, they're all over the place when we read through these gospel accounts. We think that we can surmise what's going to happen. One plus one is two, and so you just kind of know what's going to happen. But then all of a sudden, God turns everything on its, on, 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 on its head. And the thing that we would least expect is the thing that dominates the story. And for tonight, we have two individuals who are going to have this monumental meeting together. You are going to have, first of all, Herod. Herod, who is absolutely delighted that he has the chance to have an audience with Jesus. He's excited. You can hear it in his words. He wants to see something that only this Jesus can do, and he is excited to do so. And then, juxtaposed to that, you have Jesus, who is the one who performs miracles and who has these dozens of miracles that he performed demonstrating his power. And you have Jesus, who is the consummate communicator, the perfect communicator, who loves to teach and to talk. We have all of the, the hundreds and thousands of words of Jesus in the Gospels as he reveals the knowledge of God to people through parables and through his sermons. And, and so what a perfect marriage you have, isn't it? You have Herod, who is excited to see Jesus, and you have Jesus, who is the Word become flesh, the great communicator, the great miracle worker, and so you can see, obviously, what's going to happen then, right? But yet, as we see Jesus brought into the presence of Herod, and if you were looking through the red letter edition of this, to see what are these things that Jesus is going to say to Herod, or what are these miracles that Jesus is going to do in his presence? silence. This is the only individual in the passion story that Jesus does not even acknowledge them by speaking a single word to them. I mean, think about it. When Jesus is arrested, he gives answers when uh, he used to give testimony as to who he is, when he's brought before the high priest, even though he is mocked. When finally he is challenged as to his divinity, he answers and speaks to them. When he comes before Pontius Pilate, that puppet king, he answers and he engages in him with dialogue. But with Herod, with Herod, the word of life goes silent. When the word of life gives you the silent treatment, the perfect communicator stops communicating. The miracle worker ceases to do his miracles. The silence becomes deafening. And may we find together this evening as we look at these ironies of the passion just what it is. What is the issue at hand here that leaves the Lord of life, the great communicator and miracle worker, to not honor Herod with so much as a word, with not so much as the lifting of the finger? 
May we understand how we need to be careful of this, this trap which has been set that Herod has fallen into ourselves. Most importantly, can we understand the power, the power of a Savior who silently goes about his divine activity of love. He had been waiting to see Jesus. And when he saw him, no man had ever been more disappointed. Maybe to understand all this and to wrap our arms around it a little bit, it helps to uh, get a little bit of a backstory on, on, on this King Herod. Uh, remember when Jesus was born that the wise men, uh, they come to Jerusalem and they go to a King Herod. They're looking for Jesus. That's a different individual. The Herod who tried to assassinate Jesus as a young infant, that Herod um, was long since dead. This Herod, Herod Antipas, is his son. He rules only a portion of the kingdom that his father reigned, although he is a ruthless individual. There's a reason that he and Pilate are enemies. They were constantly trying to undermine one another. They were political adversaries in uh, the worst of terms. And truthfully, really, the reason that we're introduced to this Herod Antipas is primarily because of his relationship with the forerunner of Jesus, with John the Baptist. This is the Herod that John the Baptist accuses, and there wasn't much to accuse him of, everybody knew it, that he had committed adultery. And as punishment for it, this is the Herod that has John the Baptist arrested. This is the Herod who is going to have John the Baptist beheaded. And yet this is also the Herod that when it came to his relationship with John the Baptist, it's odd. He kind of liked him. It's this odd dynamic that we have that's uh, recorded for us on the pages of Scripture. John always had one message. Repent. Sin. The path that we have been taking. Repent and turn and be turned back to God. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was the message of John, um, a chapter and verse, every word that came out of his mouth, always pointing people to Jesus. But notice... Herod had no use for that whatsoever. But he still thought that John was kind of interesting. He kind of liked him. There was just something about him that made life a little more interesting. It's kind of like when you come home from church and somebody asks you, how was church today? We've all said this. Oh, it was, it was nice. Just kind of nice. Uh, there was some nice music that was played. The choir did a nice job. We saw some nice people there. Uh, there's just something about it going to church, something about it that just kind of makes you feel nice. You see, Herod had a void in his life that really was a void of entertainment. He was looking for things that made his life, his worldly life, a little bit nicer. He had nothing to do whatsoever with that repentant stuff. And so, when he has the opportunity to meet Jesus, the one who John the Baptist, remember, said, he's more powerful than I. This is the guy that I'm the forerunner of. Notice something about Herod's amazing interaction with Jesus. You would think if you executed the forerunner that you would have at least a little bit of guilt as you hear that Jesus is going to come to you. Does he exhibit any of that? No, no, none whatsoever. Does he show any remorse over his sin that everybody knew about? No. Jesus was coming, and he wasn't bothered by his sin. He was still happy that Jesus was going to be coming because what he had wanted to see was a miracle. What he had wanted to see was some kind of entertainment. And that, dear friends, that view of church, that just kind of wants something that's it's nice, that doesn't dwell so much on that whole sin and repentance thing. That is the thing that your Lord and Savior does not even lift up his eyes to acknowledge. It's that, that quest for entertainment or the nice things of, that is the thing that Jesus launches into the silent treatment and says, my miracles have purpose. My words have purpose. I am the Lamb of God who is to take away the sin of the world. And all of my miracles point only to that. And all of the words that I speak, 
They proclaim me only to be the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who is to take away the sin of the world. And when someone looks to him for anything other than that, your Lord and your Savior, he falls silent. That his salvation would not be dishonored as though it was just something which is nice. And we ask ourselves why it is that we've gathered together here this evening. And, and, and I hope that we can say some things that are nice and hear some nice music. And, but at the same time, there is that truth that rises above all of these things. It's above our emotions. We probably don't even perceive it. As a matter of fact, we don't understand how much we need it. God has brought us this evening here, not because we need something that is nice, but we need something that is life, something that is salvation. And the irony of all of it is that if we listen to the silence of Jesus, I'd submit to you that it sends us on our way with something which is truly profound and lovely. Yes, Jesus is the Lamb of God who was to take away the sin of the world. Nothing was going to distract him from that. Nothing. Remember the words of Isaiah who teaches us that as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he does not open his mouth. He's not distracted. He doesn't want to be an entertainer. He wants to be a savior. And so silently, he suffers. Silently, he fulfills. Silently, almost it may seem emotionless, he sets his face like flint to the one reason why he is here. As we say it so often, for us, Lent is all about Jesus, and for Jesus, Lent is all about you. And so that nothing would distract from the purpose that he is there, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, well, of you. He silently sets his face and resolutely goes about to be that Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if we listen to the deafening, unemotional roar of the silence of Jesus, who simply is quietly, faithfully, always going about the work of being your Savior, there is something that I would submit to you that we find that is amazing in its comfort. Sometimes I perceive it, sometimes I'm just, I'm just, I don't get it. My Savior is always there. Always faithfully going about his calling as the Lamb of God. And whether it's an emotional evening for us this evening, and whether the songs strike a chord with us, or whether we start striking incorrect chords all over the place, that does not change the faithfulness of the Savior, who silently, resolutely goes about his task. Herod had, want to, had been wanting to see Jesus, and nobody went away more disappointed than him because miracles, he didn't get any. He didn't even get a word. We too have been wanting to see Jesus. And we don't get miracles tonight. Jesus does not even, we don't even quote a single word of his tonight. But what we do have placed in front of us is the silence of his obedience and the love and the forgiveness of his cross. We have the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and who in the quiet of an evening hopefully will be able to come to you and say, yes, I was always there. I am the Savior who loves you. And may your heart be set at ease. May you be comforted because I have loved you and I have redeemed you. And you will be with me forever in the kingdom of heaven. That, of all things, Jesus communicates to us with silence. As a lamb simply is what a lamb has come to be. So as we go our separate ways, may we strip away all of the other things and may there only be one thing which is in front of us this evening, a Savior, a Savior who stands silently in front of you with the embrace of love and forgiveness that he gives to you. He had been wanting to see Jesus was here and then he went away wanting May God create in the hearts of each and every one of us a deep desire to see this Jesus. And may the things that he creates the desire for us, we look at his faithful silence. May we joy in the forgiveness and the glory that is yours. Amen. We continue as we gather our offerings for our work.
Let us pray. Lord, our strength, the battle of good and evil rages within and around us, and our ancient foe tempts us with his deceits and empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word. And when we fall, raise us up again and restore us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. We conclude with our final hymn.